Welcome aboard to Ironside Sheets. Mr. Klein, installment two, copyright 2018, Marco Ochoa, all rights reserved. Now on the matter of wielding my power boundlessly, had I done so, I would have killed both your men and taken their money. Of course, that would have been harsh, albeit somewhat justified. The real boundary breaker would have come in the second you stepped into my office. You would have suffered a worse fate. Did they tell you about how they were disarmed after pointing their pistols at me after being chastised? I doubt that just the same. They don't seem like the types to have the spines to do so. No, for their employers who condone such pathetic behavior, I would have taken the use of their limbs and their money. Your employees may be weak, pathetic, pathetic excuses for men, but at least they aren't the pansies that allowed their employees to behave as they did. Mr. Klein stood. He was shorter than the two men's employer, but noticeably broader. They looked each other in the eye as Mr. Klein approached. Ms. Porter could sense the employer's discomfort bubbling up. Success made him complacent. He wasn't ready for a challenge. Mr. Klein stopped mere inches from the employer's face. The man that entered with the employer pushed between Mr. Klein and his ward. He stood tall and strong until Mr. Klein dipped his torso in a stark bow, gripped his ankle, rose, and flipped him onto the top of his head. The bodyguard flopped onto the wood floor, his heels leaving imprints in the floorboards. The employer backed away, but Mr. Klein cuffed his wrist to his bodyguard's ankle. Drag your filth from my office, would you? I appreciate your compliance. The employer hauled his bodyguard's weight out the front door. He looked almost like a crab with his claw caught on a bit of cloth, scrambling to get free. You will pay for this, Mr. Klein. So help me. I'll ensure your demise. Mr. Klein closed the door behind the employer and returned to his desk. He almost smiled. Sir, these are the practices that risk your business. You just lost a source of temporary workers. Soon you will lose the very means by which you get your wares. The good thing about all that, Ms. Porter, is that I don't particularly care. We have money. We have money enough to keep you healthy and keep me in good standing should the business fail. We'll survive, and if need be, I'll just bring you on to whatever new business I start. Nothing to worry about. Ms. Porter sighed. Scuffles always get you giddy. I'll follow you wherever you go. I owe you that much. I just hope you're in well enough health to make that transition. Mr. Klein stepped out of his office. The night ran long. Paperwork accumulated on his, to his desk over the course of the week, and he hadn't had anything to take his mind off the ever-increasing pile. He combed through his pop property. Hours ago, curfew passed. Businessmen of days of old rarely understood that if one were to run one ship as efficiently as possible, one had to run a tight schedule for those under their employment. The curfew ensured everyone slept properly, rested, repaired. Tomorrow would be just as laborious for them, if not more so. He, had, he didn't want any of his workers to drag on in the morning. His ears pricked up. Something fell nearby. Mr. Klein bowed his head and concentrated, narrowing down where the sound could have come from. He took off at a pace, only stopping when he came to a holding cell opposite from where the noise emitted. He peered through the cell's bars, picking up on silhouettes tussling about outside one of the living quarters. Two male, one female. Mr. Klein tilted his ears, grasping for information. If no one will serve him justice for the wrong he did me, then I'll have to take it upon myself. Of course, sir, but don't you think perhaps this is not the way to go about it? I've heard tell of how Mr. Klein is protective of his wares. He can't tolerate any number of slights to him, but damage... He can tolerate any number of slights to him, but damage his... You're just afraid after he clocked you in the jaw. I'll give it to him. He's got quite the right hook. However, I don't think there will be much he can do while he deals with slowed production. Just won't... Just one won't do that much. This is his best one. Then you'll take care of his second best. Me? Yes. Quit doubling what I tell you. 
After we have enjoyed ourselves, our guns will take care of a few more. We'll, ha we'll have to hightail it out of here, but Mr. Klein will be ruined. Mr. Klein balled up his fists and took a step in the men's direction, but he didn't so much as get a chance to form a proper thought before the two men were rushed. Bones snapped and cracked on impact and dust sprang up from the floor. We'll come back for you, mongrel. Mark my words. Come back for me as much as you like. Even if I die, at least I would never have stooped to the level of drugging and taking a woman in the middle of the night for the sake of getting to another man. I'll die with dignity and a sense of satisfaction that your bones will never be the same. The two men clambered away, and the savior led the dazed lass back to her living quarters. Mr. Klein followed behind the newcomer, watching his every move. He left her at the door where her quartermates drew her inside. Then he returned to his own room. Mr. Klein turned on his heels and headed home. The following morning, Mr. Klein held a private auction. He acquired too many wares and had to make room for more to come. The ones up for auction over underproduced and were a detriment to his profits in the long run. He wasn't fond of the three on a good day. On an off day, they disgusted him. The tallest of the three, a bony creature with sallow eyes, went by the name Midnight Crawler before he was captured. His antics started off harmless, though frightening, creeping along the windowsills of various homes throughout the night, turning into many children's boogeyman. However, once he found an unlocked window and a child went missing, he became the city's most wanted criminal. Only two of his 30 victims were found, one dead, the other left mute with the broken psyche. The middleman, a squat, pudgy, muscular figure, sodomized six women and six men, using his powerful arms to quickly overwhelm them where they stood. Before an officer found him, he was the 13th victim. Subsequent backup took the per perpetrator down after the number 13 failed to report in. The woman on the end was an interesting case. She was a spy and a government weapon designed to be a saboteur. She was highly praised in secrecy in her early years. She fell from grace when she killed a child soldier who sent, was sent to bomb an embassy. The impromptu mission left her vulnerable to surveillance, and some up-and-coming hotshot recorded her and posted the footage online before it could be confiscated. Mr. Klein didn't particularly dislike what she did. It, it was the right call as far as he was concerned, but he disliked how easily she allowed herself to be disenfranchised. She had resources at her disposal, and she let them slip from her fingers. He despised the sad shell she'd become. He found the vilest buyers the market had to offer for the former two. For the latter, he found buyers three stages up in class, still vile.